Is your Twitter feed sick? These days, harassment, hate speech, and misinformation are poisoning social media. And Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey seems to know this. He's trying to cure Twitter of these ills, but how? At a rare interview at Twitter headquarters in San Francisco, I asked him. What is broken about Twitter today? What is broken about Twitter? I mean, I, I think it really depends on who you follow um, and your perception of um, what you see and, and how you feel about that. I mean, I, there, there's a lot of emphasis today on politics Twitter. And politics Twitter tends to be pretty divisive and it tends to be pretty contentious and you see a lot of outrage and you see a lot of um, a lot of unhealthy debate that you probably want to walk away from tangibly. Mm -hmm. If you go to other Twitters like NBA Twitter or K-pop Twitter, you see the complete opposite. You see a lot of empowering conversation. So we do have a lot of focus right now on some of the negative things given the current environment and I believe it's important to see those. I believe it's important to see the dark areas of society so that we can acknowledge and we can address them. And I, I think the only way to address them is through conversation. But it is hard, especially when it feels toxic and you want to walk away from it. What about incentives that encourage the extremes, encourage polarization? Just backing up a bit. Like when we started the company and the service 12 years ago, we weren't necessarily thinking about some of the repercussions from our actions. And, and they look quite small at the time. For instance, uh, we thought, you know, well, people are following you, so we should count them. And then we should put that count right on your profile page. And obviously people care about that, so we should make it big. But that one small choice, and it felt very small at the time, and it felt obvious at the time, put an incentive to grow that number. Is that the right attention? Is that the right incentive that we should be driving? I don't think it is today. I don't think it matters as much in context of how many conversations you have or how much you contribute back to the, the network. And another good example that I think will help a lot of what we're trying to do in health is what we see with echo chambers. We, we only give people one tool right now, which is to follow an account. So you want people to be able to follow stories or subjects or hashtags? Yeah, I mean, we've been focusing a lot of the service uh, today more and biasing it more towards topics, more towards interests. It sounds like you are willing and ready and willing to rebuild the entire house, to renovate everything. We're ready to question everything. I mean, I, I, we've changed so much in Twitter over the past 12 years, and I know it doesn't always feel that way, but we've, we've changed a lot, but we haven't changed the underlying fundamentals. We haven't changed some of the incentives that we probably took for granted because they were easy when we built it um, and they felt obvious when they built it, but it may not be relevant today. When you say health, is that a euphemism for something? Well, <clears throat> we, you know, we, we've seen all these issues on the service. We've seen abuse, we've seen trolling, we've seen harassment, we've seen uh, misinformation, and it came to a point where we felt we were playing whack-a-mole. We were just, you know, and, and also just addressing the surface level behaviors and, set of, and symptoms rather than looking deeper at the second order drivers. What's behind all these actions? And we wanted something that was really tangible, um, that could be comprehensive of everything that we're seeing. So we were asked the question, what if you could, monitor, what, what if you could measure the health of a conversation? And we think we can because we all know when we've been in a conversation that has felt toxic that we want to walk away from. And that's an indicator. We've, we've been in conversations that don't feel toxic, that feel empowering, that we want to stay in. That's an indicator. So if we can measure that, then we can measure our progress, and then we can actually understand if we're helping. We're asking ourselves the question, like, how do we earn people's trust? It's actually one of our operating principles, which is earn people's trust. And we do that because we realize that more and more people have fear of companies like ours. And the perceived power that companies like ours have over how they live and even think every single day. And that is not right and it is not fair. But you're right that a lot of Americans, a lot of people around the world, fear the power of these Silicon Valley giants. Are they right to fear your power? Do you feel as powerful as they think you are? I, I don't 
feel as powerful as they think they are, as I think we are, but I do understand the sentiment. I do understand how actions by us could generate more fear. And I think the only way we can disarm that is by being a lot more open, explaining in a straightforward way why we make decisions, how we make decisions. You all are every day taking down uh, botnets and suspicious accounts and trying to stamp out harassment and abuse. That, that is happening every day. But I wonder if users don't see it happening enough. Yeah, it, it's an amazing point. And like a lot of the output of our health initiatives are pretty invisible in the short term. Uh, we have had people, um, some of your colleagues, for instance, say that, you know, I, I've noticed it improve. Mm. It's still there, but it improved. And, and you, I, I think you see a brunt of the negativity. Like our, our journalists... You meaning journalists? You, like journalists get a, a, you know, an unfair dosing of a lot of the contention just based on Everyone's what Everyone's a media critic. Around. Well, based on what you're reporting around. And... I, I think, um, you know, we need to do a better job at, at protecting and ensuring that you can do your work without distraction. But um, over, the, over the short term, a lot of this work is invisible, and over the long term, it starts to add up. What is the timeline for reexamining how you show follower counts or the use of the like button? You know, we're, I mean, we're, we're looking at, and thinking about all these things right now. We've... we've um, We've definitely had conversations about them. But would you say, like, by the end of the year, there's going to be those fundamental changes to Twitter? I don't. I I worry about a time frame like that because we we also need to take into consideration we're we're a small company. I mean, we, in comparison with our peers, um, we're a small company, but we have this outsized impact and I I believe importance and like I, I there is a lot of what's in Twitter that you would find in a public square to use the older analogy. You mean all the graffiti on the walls? <laughs> well, the, there's part of that, but there's also really amazing open conversation and there's the ability to walk up to anyone and strike something up. So there's there's positives and there's what people perceive to be negative as well. Look, I met my wife on Twitter. I'm always going to love Twitter. <laughs> but I kind of feel like it's a garden that's been overrun by weeds. Do you feel like you're the gardener just struggling to keep up? There are certainly times where we felt like we're behind. Um, but that that goes back to my point of like we need to be really good with prioritizing mm. and sequencing and understanding what matters most. So if the incentives are going to have the greatest impact, then we should prioritize that. Is your job to make sure people are not misinformed on Twitter? I I, I think we need to be really thoughtful about what that means. Like what what is misinformation? And how how do we how do we help people determine um, credibility. Of the classic example the from the 2016 election was the Pope endorses Donald Trump, right? That was a popular article that spread around on Twitter and Facebook. Wouldn't it be pretty easy just to make sure that lie doesn't spread? I don't think it's pretty easy um, because you have to extend it and you have to generalize it to everything that could happen along that vector. So I, I think what we could do is help provide more context and whether it be showing all the different perspectives and people who are saying this is fake and and uh, and people who are believing it and like to actually advance that conversation. That's one way. I'm not not assuming that's going to solve everything, but it gives journalists more opportunity to actually remove some of that bias and and call it out for what it is. Um, and I, I think we can do a lot to help there, but also identifying more credible voices in real time and amplifying that credibility is is something we can do, but. We have not figured this out, but I, I do think it would be dangerous for a company like ours, going back to that fear point, to be arbiters of truth. Did Twitter make mistakes <clears throat> around Alex Jones and Infowars, around the, the initial announcement that, no, he has not been abusing, no, he has not been uh, over the line, but then a few days later, giving him a timeout? Well, we, <clears throat> our system works by people reporting content. So we, um, we don't, we're not in a place to proactively review everything. Um, and we act when we receive reports. That, that is just you know, consistently enforcing our approach and our roles. People may disagree with that approach. People may say, you should be a lot more proactive around all the content. And 
while we could do that, it just it requires so many resources. I mean, hours and hours and hours of, of, of looking through video content. So at the time, uh, we did not receive reports that we felt we could take any action on that violated on our terms of service. Your colleagues at CNN pointed out a number of them. We took action on one, and then we noticed that all the others, um, likely because they were made known to Alex Jones and InfoWars, were being deleted. As we receive reports, we take action. And there are varying degrees of enforcement action, starting with warnings to temporary suspensions, which the accounts are now in, all the way to a permanent suspension. Is it possible that he'll, he'll change his behavior on Twitter? I think he really might do that. I don't know. I mean, just, just stepping back, like, we have seen, we have evidence that shows, like, temporary suspensions, temporary lockouts will change behavior. Mm -hmm. It will change people's approach. I'm not naive enough to believe that it's going to change it for everyone, but it's worth a shot. Um, you know, it's like we, and it, but more importantly, it's, it's consistent with our, our enforcement. Like we can't just keep changing randomly based on our viewpoints because that just adds to the fear of companies like ours uh, making these, these judgments according to our own, our own personal views of who we like and who we don't like. And, and, and taking that out upon those people that those viewpoints change over time. And that just feels random and it doesn't feel fair and it doesn't earn anyone's trust because you can't actually see what's behind it. Do you miss the days when you would just use Twitter to meet up with your friends? <laughs> because now we're talking about how it's used to cause violence. I, I mean, I, I, think, I think it's just so important to see the world for what it is. And I, I don't want to live in a world where it's where just we only see the happy things and we only focus on like what makes us feel good because we got a lot of stuff to figure out. So no, I don't, I don't miss them. Um, cause we're, we're seeing, we're seeing a lot of important things that we need to finally discuss.